This is an unusual program. Normally, the past programs, we've, uh, we've done a profile of the city itself. But this time, we're going to look at one of Beverly Hills's, I would say, forgotten heroes and a forgotten resident of Beverly Hills that goes way back to the 1920s. That most people uh, sort of remember his name. Yes, I, that name does seem familiar, but who was Bosworth? And some people say Bosworth was an actor. He had nothing to do with Beverly Hills. Or, oh yes, he used to ride his horse down Beverly Hills, but he was an actor? So you, ha you have all these different things of confusion that relate to this great man. And we'll see tonight why Hobart Bosworth and his life and times all intertwines with the city of Beverly Hills through the most important time of his life and Beverly Hills' life. That would be from 1920 to about 1940. This is a shot of Hobart Bosworth. Hobart Bosworth was born in 1867. He was born in Murrieta, Ohio. His father was a naval officer. And, uh, he grew up around, among the rivers of Ohio and always dreamed of being a ship's captain. After he graduated from school, he went around the world. He ended up in San Francisco about 1899. Mr. Bosworth decided that uh, he would continue to do this, but something happened to him, unfortunately. He did come down with a slight case of tuberculosis. He got over it quickly, and on another trip to San Francisco, he uh, met someone at a ship's bar. They said, we're going to go and see a play. The theater just literally bit him. Couldn't get enough of the theater. And finally he jumped ship altogether because a friend of his said, you know, uh, they'll pay you five bucks or something if you become an extra. Went and got the job and he held a spear in some of these, these plays. And that started his career. He started with a company in San Francisco and started to travel all around the country uh, working as this extra. But little by little he was given lines. And then he met some very important stage actors of the 19th century in America. He was trained by them. And eventually he started to do small parts in which he was beginning to be known as an actor. He started on the stage in 1885 and by 1902 he was already uh, famous on the stage as a, as a young leading man. And he worked with famous uh, stars of the time. Around 1905, 1906, he was almost world famous. He went to England, in Canada, he went to France, and this is one of his, his characters. So in 1885, you know, he was not just a youngster, he was, he was up there. And uh, by the time of the turn of the century, he was an adult. Dates all the way back from stage to film, from 1885 all the way up to his death in 1943. He was on the stage or on films, and just a fascinating character in America's stage history as well as Beverly Hills. These are some of the other roles that he did. That's him in the center uh, playing the two gentlemen of Verona. This is an original uh, photograph that came from his collection. Hobart Bosworth had married one of his uh, co-stars in the 1890s and she eventually with her career split up from him and they were divorced. Until he met another woman who was 35 years younger than him in 1920 and they married. He was 52, I think. She was like 21. She stayed with him till his death, and she just died in January of 1997 at the age of 101. Now, I've talked to her for tw almost 15 to 17 years on the phone, and I knew that she was sitting on the famous Hobart Bosworth archives. And uh, we've been, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and others have been trying to go out and look at what was there, but she was, say, a little off by <laughs> over the last. 40 years. So when she finally died, uh, the family contacted the proper authorities and uh, eventually got to me. And uh, I've been help working with the family on uh, settling the estate. And it's part of it was going to be donated to the academy and part of it to the uh, Gene Autry Museum because uh, Bosworth was starred in some of the earliest Western film. Because of the tuberculosis, he had many attacks while he was working as a stage star. He thought of himself as being a painter, so he decided to paint. Until a friend of his said that a movie company in Chicago was looking for stage stars to act in films. This was in 1909. So he went to this man, Colonel William Selig, as you see here on the screen. Colonel William Selig had a studio in, in Chicago 
called the Selig Polyscope Company. They made uh, special machines which you could see little film strips and people would look in these little boxes, you know, mutoscopes and, and kinetoscopes. Selig was making the actual machines for Edison and others. Mr. Selig here decided that it would be nice to shoot a film in California in 1907 and the film was The Count of Monte Cristo. So in 1907 he sent a group of people out here headed by the star Tom Sanchi. And everybody liked it so much out here, Selig said, I think we'll just build a studio in California, which happens to be the very first studio ever built in California. So this is the first setting ever made and built in California in 1908 for a film called Carmen. This is a bull ring. This carpenter just tacked it on and they're looking at it. This is their stage. These are skylights. This was built on top of a building, downtown Los Angeles, at Main and 8th Street, which today is called Dearden's Department Store. It's still there. Of course, the roof has changed quite dramatically since 1908. This is the sort of filmmaking technology that Mr. Bosworth was introduced to when he got involved in 1909. There was not enough room on top of the rooftop. When Bosworth finally was asked to come and act in a couple film plays, as we called them then, photo plays. This is behind a Chinese laundry on Olive Street between 7th and 8th in 1909. And this is the outdoor stage right here. This is the bed and the setting. And you can see it's right outside with buildings, palm trees and everything. And these are the men. This is the camera right here. This is how they did films. Now, could you imagine when the winds come up at 4 o'clock? So all of this was blowing in the wind. And this is supposed to be in someone's bedroom. This is the crudeness of the early days of filmmaking where Bosworth began. There were other actors as early as 1896 who were already acting in films. In France, for example, Madame Alice Guy Blachet of, of the Gaumont Company was already making sound motion pictures from 1896. 1897 to 1899, she made 150 sound films. They were done with a, a recording device, like a, a record, and she would synchronize the record to the film. So technology had come a long way by this time, by 1909, but not in California. In California, this was it. We had one camera and a tripod and a set. And this is another view of that uh, stage and how they would do these films outside. But his first major film that he did was In the Power of the Sultan. The LA Times wrote about him in the 20s and 30s as being the dean of motion pictures, the first of the great stage stars to act in films. This is a typical scene about 1908 at May, at down on Olive Street. What you're seeing now are very extremely rare photographs of the very, very, very first dramatic filmmaking in California. Now, the East Coast, we had the Edison Company already doing all this since 1903. But The Great Train Robbery was the first real narrative American feature film in which they actually had editing and cuts and a star. And this is Bosworth here in character for In the Power of the Sultan. 42 years old already, see. He was just beginning in the film industry. These are the kinds of settings and the kinds of stories that they were doing. This is very theatrical, having guns surrounding the, the character here and Hobart here. It's done just like a stage play. So Bosworth really had the greatest of times. He did not have to project and act on the stage, which caused him great hurt. He could mouth the words. They did have scripts, and they did memorize their lines, but they mouthed, spoke softly, you know, the, the lines to each other. And that's how they did these plays. The next film he did was The Roman in uh, late 1909. That's him in the center there. This is another scene in which he's being taken away. See the lighting is just natural light. They would have to shoot from about 10 o'clock in the morning till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the sun was already going to the west. You'd lose the sunlight. So they just had the middle of the day really to work. This is Silver Lake. There was a trolley line that went right from downtown to Silver Lake and Edendale and the other areas north of L.A. So it was easy to get all the actors there. Horses were carted over there. And uh, Bosworth used to ride horses. The horses to him were like a, having a car. It was second nature. So riding in films was no problem for Mr. Bosworth. Silver Lake, by the way, was a man-made reservoir. Selig got fed up with like his directors and many of the other people with working behind a Chinese laundry. And the decision was made in Chicago to build a permanently built studio in California. 
The very first permanently built studio in California was Selig. They built it at 1845 Alessandro Street, which is today Glendale Boulevard. That is Edendale, and that's where all the studios were, and that's where Selig was, and that's where this house was. Right behind here is a sign, and the sign says the Selig Polyscope Company West Coast Branch. They started to build a mission-style studio there. This is a glass stage right here. This is the main entrance. You can see the bell towers and bells in them. This is a glass state. The light would shine through the glass panes and would diffuse the light on the black and white panchromatic film, which was very contrasty, so there wouldn't be no shadows on your face. So it was really uh, the technology of the day to get nice bright light without shadow. So they devised sprinkler systems on the roof to keep the water flowing so it would diffuse some of the heat from getting inside. This is where it is, Clifford and Alessandro Street. It's now a plant of some kind. Unfortunately, it was removed in the 1940s. This was a photograph I shot out of Moving Picture World of uh, 1912 showing the studio there. We have a plaque down the street, which was later the famous Keystone Max Sennett Studios, which was built later. Now, these are the cast members of the Selig Company in 1910. Art Acord. He was a famous Western star later at Universal and was well known in the early silent era. And all the rest were stage stars for many years on the American stage who quit the stage to work in films because they got paid better and it was, the working conditions were fantastic. And they became bigger stars than they could ever be on the stage because everyone saw them in theaters everywhere. And there's a good close-up shot of them all. And there's Hobart Bosworth there, the dapper one. Okay, and this shot here is Hobart Bosworth in one of his characters, right in front of the gate of the Selig Studio on Alessandro Street in around 1910. He did somewhere in around uh, 60 films between 1909 and when he left them in about 1913. This is a decent setting. You see the glass panes of the uh, stage? You can see the setting was painted and just literally held up with braces, stage braces, just like they do in, in the theater. Sometimes they even painted pictures on the walls. They rented furniture. They had costumes that were made or gotten from uh, seamstresses and others. Costume rental place in L.A. at the time. Except for the theater. The for the theater, they did manage to get a lot of their settings and things from them. Now this is Bosworth again here. These are showing you all his different characters and films that he did. They did everything from Shakespeare to uh, story, original stories to folklore to uh, fairy tales. They were supposed to shoot a film called Teddy Roosevelt in Africa. Of course, they didn't want to go to Africa, so they brought in elephants and other things to the studio, and they just touted the film that it was Teddy Roosevelt in Africa, and everyone thought it was. Bosworth wanted to do a better version of The Count of Monte Cristo, and in uh, 1911, he did finally his The Count of Monte Cristo, and this is Bosworth sitting next to uh, the man, and uh, this is from his version of The Count of Monte Cristo. They're on a ship. This is one of Bosworth's films. It's called In the Days of Gold, and there's Hobart Bosworth here, and the cast included Betty Hart, who was a very famous stage star of her day, Coy Watson. Coy Watson was a photographer and actor. His family were commercial photographers in Hollywood and L.A. It's like uh, these breeds of families that worked in the industry all the way back to the very beginning. And like Frank Montgomery, whose uh, daughter was Baby Peggy. I don't know if you remember her. Her father was the, the, the top stuntman for all the Westerns from the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. These are the families which made up the early Hollywood, which is very interesting. And of course, Bosworth being one of the earliest actors in this whole early industry of California. In 1890-something, Hobart Bosworth was on tour with a, a stage play, and he got a visitor, Jack London and his wife Charmaine. Remember, he went to sea as a kid, and he loved Jack London's stories. And when he thought Jack London was going to visit him and pay homage to him. He just flipped over this. And this is a shot of Jack London and his wife Charmaine. They became close friends. When Bosworth decided to be in films, he never thought he would you know, produce or direct films. He thought he would be an actor in films. In uh, 1913, he kept in touch with Jack London all these years, and he formed a company in 1913 called the Bosworth Incorporated, which would produce all of Jack London's stories for the screen. He signed Jack London and starred in the first one, The Sea Wolf. And this is a very rare shot of Bosworth in the first filmed 
version of the sea wolf and, uh, made on location in San Francisco and around California and this is what Boz would look like around 1913 he became quote a film mogul his a studio owner a production company producer etc this was a big departure for him but this is a fan postcard but these were beautiful tinted cards. This is Jack London at the time when he was producing the films. This is Jack actually helping him write the screenplay for the film. Now this is Bosworth Productions here in 1913 and 14. In 1914, there was a company formed called Paramount Pictures Co Corporation. It was formed by a man named William W. Hawkinson. Mr. Hawkinson formed a distributing company and with the distributors that he would distribute films for independent producers. One of the independent producers was the, was the Lasky Feature Play Company. One of the producers was the Famous Players Company of Adolf Zukor. Another one was Sherry. Another one was Belasco. And Bosworth Incorporated included. They were all founders of Paramount Pictures Corporation. And Hobart Bosworth was one of the founders. One of the first films that Bosworth would do was uh, the Sea Wolf, which would be released through this new Paramount Pictures Corporation. Finally, he started to do other stories. This is Bosworth here as a Mexican, on location in the desert, and right on this case right here, it's Bosworth Feature Company, Lloyd Carlton director, and that's Lloyd Carlton right there next to him, the director of the film. This is a one called Burning Daylight, which he shot up in Truckee. They didn't have a studio yet, so he leased a studio right next door to the old Selig Company in Edendale where he started. There was a studio built there already in 1913 called the Norbig Studio. It was like a rental lot. This this is the actual formation of a company that would actually build Bosworth's own studio. And this caption reads, Hobart Bosworth, the famous director who is thought to be retiring from the corporation bearing his own name, Bosworth Inc., has in the past year assumed a foremost place among American manufacturers. Frank A. Garbutt, who's right up here on the left, a Los Angeles capitalist, is said to be the new head of the Bosworth Company. Frank Garbutt is a very interesting character, which, but he's like, he built the Los Angeles Athletic Club. He built a lot of Paramount Studios, the actual studios. Uh, he was the one that found land out in the uh, valleys for studio ranches. He helped finance production companies and the man was like intertwined in the early history of the film industry in Los Angeles and he's like a forgotten character. This is the studio as it was constructed and built and completed at 201 North Occidental Boulevard in Los Angeles which is off of Beverly Boulevard near Temple Street. Built in 1914 is still in operation to this day. It's called today the Occidental Studios. This is the main building at Council Street and Occidental Boulevard. All this is intact. These are all dressing rooms. You see the glass roof. The glass has been enclosed, of course, over the years. But all of this is still there. And uh, this driveway here for the gates, the old gates where the car used to come through, that's all there, too. They, they treasure it as being part of the early days of the studios of Los Angeles. So this is the, how it looks in about 1929. And there it is again. These are the people that helped form Paramount. Frank Garbutt, W.W. W. Hawkinson, who actually formed the company. Adolf Zukor, William Sherry, James Steele, Hobart Bosworth, uh, Samuel Goldfish, he later changed it to Goldwyn, Jesse Lasky, David Belasco, Cecil B. DeMille, J.B. Clark, w. William Smith, Hiram Abrams, these are lawyers, F.A. Powley, Raymond Powley, Edwin S. Porter, that was Edison's first major director who directed The Great Train Robbery in 1903, and the last one is Daniel Froman and Charles Froman, the, the famous entrepreneurs, stage entrepreneurs of New York City who were extremely important, the David Merricks of their day. And this was their logo, the famous Paramount logo. And that's how we looked around 1914 when the company was formed. In 1914, he sold out his interest in Paramount and his studio. And he wanted to become an actor again. Acting was his favorite thing. So he got a job over at Universal Studios. This shot was taken in 1915. This is what Universal Front used to look like on Lancashire Boulevard. And this is the open stage in back of Universal. You can see everybody had open stages. Things didn't change too much in a few years, remember, since 1907, except now they had nice modern kind of steel structures which would hold diffusers. Diffusers meaning uh, cloth that they would 
hang over these diffusers, which would do the same dif light diffusion as the glass would, except cheaper. You didn't have to build a big glass stage. This was all dirt here, and when it rained, this became mud baths, so they had to have pathways leading from buildings to building over the mud. Now, this is Hobart as he appeared in Universal Films around 1916 as a cowboy. These are the types of films he did. This is Hobart here with the fake mustache holding the baby. He became a well-known star, but remember, he was not a young man already. He was getting into his 50s now. And finally, he was signed by the Lasky Feature Play Company in 1915. He left Universal. Oh, by the way, this was at Selma and Vine Street in Hollywood in 1915. This is the Lasky DeMille Barn, which has been preserved and is across from the Hollywood Bowl. Right now is the Hollywood Studio Museum. Uh, this is Selma and Vine right here. It's at the southeast corner. That's the inner stage of the uh, Lasky Company. They had a glass stage and they had open stages too. And this is one of the major films that he did. He starred in Joan the Woman, starring Geraldine Farrar, who, Wallace Reed, who died, of, uh, unfortunately, of an overdose of uh, morphine in 1923. He was the Harrison Ford of his day. He was well-loved. And this is what the company turned into. Paramount uh, grew. The Lasky Company actually bought out their distributor, Paramount. It became famous players Lasky Paramount. This is at Sunset and Vine. This is now Home Savings. Okay, and that's the interior of the stages, how they used to be with the fusers. During World War I, Bosworth was with the uh, Lasky Company, and that's Hobart Bosworth in the middle, starring as the Kaiser. And that's Mary Pickford there, and this is called America's Sweetheart. And that was uh, Mary's propaganda film. That's Jack Holt, by the way, one of the big stars of uh, Paramount at the time. By the early 20s, there were many changes in the studios. Bosworth moved around, and he was hired by the Goldwyn Company, who had just moved to California from New York. They moved to a studio which was already defunct, called the Triangle Studio in Culver City, and changed the name to Goldwyn Studio. Sam Goldwyn left the Lasky Company and formed his own company. And you can see the big box here. They had over the triangle sign and put Goldwyn. This is Washington Boulevard in 1919. That's now today Sony Studios. And this is Bosworth at the time when he worked for Goldwyn. And there he is in other character roles. And here he is as a cowboy working with uh, Will Rogers at Goldwyn in about 1920. He was starting to be paid a lot of money by people like Goldwyn to star in films. He played George Washington. And uh, Thomas Ince was a good friend of his. And that's Tom Ince right here directing. Tom Ince was one of the biggest moguls of his time in Los Angeles and loved Hobart Bosworth. And Bosworth worked for him for quite a while and finally hired him to work for the uh, Thomas, new Thomas Inn Studios in Culver City, built just a quarter mile uh, east of the old uh, Triangle Studio in Goldwyn, which is today now Sony Culver Studios. It's on Washington Boulevard. And this is a beautiful postcard showing it in around that time, about 1921. Hobart had some money and he decided to move to Beverly Hills and he rented this house at 219 Doheny Drive. It's still there. Oh, that's him standing outside. This is him inside his house painting his western scenes that he's been painting since the 19th century. He wanted to build himself his dream house on Hillcrest Drive near Sunset Boulevard next to the famous Waverly Mansion. Today, the house is pretty much transformed into something else. This is Hobart with his young wife. And uh, this is Jack London sculpture up here. And these are his collectibles and things, uh, his big ship's wheel from a ship from a sailing ship from Ohio. And there they are posing with it. And there he is with his ship models and enjoying the life of the landed gentry of Beverly Hills in 1921 and 22. The property was purchased in 22 on Hillcrest, and the construction began in about 1923. Hobart became a Beverly Hills phenomenon. He would ride his horse all around Beverly Hills, and people knew that it was Hobart Bosworth. People stopped him and said how much they enjoyed him on the stage, and he started to ride everywhere on this wonderful white horse. This is the corner, by the way, of Doheny and Dayton Way. That's the corner house. The house is right there behind those sh sheds, and those um, shrubs. Now these are some of his paintings he painted. He uh, sold paintings for years, did very well with them. The family still has most of them, but he's a forgotten painter. Uh, his value is, uh, is negligent. Uh, this is when he appeared in Sacramento at the famous anniversary of the 49ers. He's supposed to be Kit Carson. This is him as a Scottish soldier. He played w William Wallace. Remember Braveheart? That's William Wallace's Braveheart. This is a model of the house on Hillcrest. 
And there's his driveway right there leading up to his wonderful house. Other houses in the neighborhood at the time in the 20s, the Harold Lloyd estate, the uh, Gloria Swanson's estate where Sunset and Crescent meet. This is Charles Ray's house just down Sunset uh, Boulevard, uh, not too far past uh, Benedict Canyon. It's still there, but it's been changed dramatically. Pick Fair was the biggest thing in the time there. Bosworth came, he was not the first, but he was one of these movie people that was attracted to Beverly Hills because of many other movie people that he knew intimately and very well. His good, his good friends, Will Rogers' house. Will Rogers was an old friend of his, and they used to ride together, play polo together. There's Will as he would come down the driveway, and of course Falcon Lair, way up at the top of Benedict Canyon. Now, the, uh, in the Beverly Hills Citizen, Hobart Bosworth's model house was uh, featured. This is Beverly Hills around that time to show you how sparsely populated it was, and you can see big lots everywhere. There's Rodeo Drive with the bridal path, the Beverly Hills Hotel, which was the hub of just about everybody. Filmmaking, Harold Lloyd in front of the hotel. So you you see filmmakers, filmmaking, and stars were everywhere. They had their own theater. This is the Beverly Theater at Beverly and Wilshire. That's 1926. This is uh, Beverly Drive and, and Burton Way. Okay, this is what Beverly Hills looked like when he would ride up his horses and drive around the area. In the 20s, the Beverly Hills Railway Station, Morocco Station as it was called. First, the big parties they would have at the hotel. You know, Doug Fairbanks right here, and we'd have Will Rogers and his family, and William S. Hart. The Beverly Hills Hotel postcards at the time of Bosworth. This is the main dining room at the Beverly Hills Hotel. This is from Bosworth's collection. And this, you can see here, is the Beverly Hills Hotel and Bungalows, 1921. This is the dinner menu. That's what they're showing. Moving picture this evening at 8.15. Hobart Bosworth in 1001. So they have dinner and see the film. Will Rogers attending these filmings. Those are by the bungalows, by the way, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Chamber of Commerce dinners with Doug Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. There's Doug and Mary and Fred Neblo. Bo Bosworth was a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Beverly Drive during the 20s and a little crowded too. I think this is the Rodeo Land and Water Company, 1922, to the purchaser of Lot 11 in Block 8, Track 45, and it talks about the tract and uh, the improvements that was going on with his property. And this is the Chamber of Commerce stationery. This was in 1923. So he really was a serious Beverly Hills person. He wanted to be involved. This is the Bridal Path stationery. It has been decided to dedicate the new bridal path on Sunset Boulevard with appropriate ceremonies on Sunday morning, April 6, 1924. He gave a check for $4,000 in 1924 as his part of the bridal path. This is when the bridal path opened. It says Irving Hellman's coach, one of the, found, one of the uh, early pioneers of Beverly Hills, and four leading Beverly Hills, California, first annual horse show parade. And this is, it says on the sign, ye bridal path for, from Beverly Hills, from the sea and mountains. The bridal path on the Rodeo Drive. Remember, it went down Rodeo. It went down Sunset and down Rodeo Drive. And there it is as it was in the 20s, with the big hedges around it. This is Beverly Hills riding clubs. The Beverly Hills Hotel had its own stables, etc. So they used the bridal path. This is another letter from the Bridal Path Association of 1925. It talks about the meeting with Irving Hellman and his aides and the Jonathan Club, and he was involved in a lot of Beverly Hills activities and improvements. Plus, he was one of the founders of the Horse Show. And here's Hobart Bosworth receiving his award. And there's how it looked in the, in the 40s before it was taken down. And now uh, that's the way it looks like today, more or less. This was taken in the 70s. Now, this is Hobart with his new house. He built this whole area here just like he would view ships, you know, coming in, because <laughs> he loved the sea. Here he is with his horse, Cameo. He would ride down to the bridal path and ride down into Beverly Hills, and he became known as uh, the dean of motion pictures and also the, many people said, the dean of Beverly Hills, too. The uh, furniture was all handmade for him. This is his gun collection. He collected flintlocks and uh, percussion uh, uh, Kentucky, Pennsylvania rifles. One of them. He got in 1902, which, which was purportedly Davy Crockett's rifle that was lost at the Battle of the Alamo. This is him and the family, his adopted son, his wife, and him. That's George and uh, the family. He died uh, about 10 years ago, and his sons are now running the estate. And there he is riding on the bri right near the bridal path. He's like, she's going to it. He was written up in magazines and newspapers all over the country. Here, Hobart Bosworth, the Dean of Hollywood. He worked up until 1943. He was at MGM. Here he is with Garbo and John Gilbert. There he is at MGM in the late 1930s. This is in 1931, organizing the horse shows. And people in here are like Irving Hellman is mentioned here, Marco Hellman. 
uh, Hoot Gibson. That's him as an Indian in The Last of the Mohicans with Harry Carey. And here he is as Robert E. Lee at MGM. In the late 30s here, but this is from the Beverly Hills Hotel and Bungalow stationery. This was the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. He had to stay there for a short time. This was the time, 1931, when he was going bankrupt. They had to move out of Beverly Hills. He had no money left. He lost all in the stock market and he died in Montrose in 1943. And a happy man ended up in 1956 getting his star in the Walk of Fame. And that is Hobart Bosworth in Beverly Hills.